Welcome to the Polly Museum at the Scott Polly Research Institute. When you visit our museum, or any museum, what you'll see is a collection of objects on display, which tell you the stories of history, culture, science, human stories of triumph and survival. But what you might not be aware of is that most museums have an even larger collection of objects hidden behind closed doors. Now, we would like to show some of these hidden objects and documents today to share with you some of the stories of two extraordinary women in polar history, Ethel Lindgren and Lady Jane Franklin. Dr. Ethel John Lindgren. Ethel Lindgren. Ethel Lindgren. Ethel was born in 1905 in Illinois, and after spending most of her childhood in America or traveling around Central Asia with her family, she moved to the UK where she began her undergraduate studies at the University of Cambridge. She read Chinese and experimental psychology, and she later went on to read her graduate studies at the university as well, where she did fieldwork in Inner Mongolia and also in Siberia. After completing her PhD, Lindgren became a research fellow at Newnham College at the University of Cambridge, and from there she lectured in social anthropology, or the study of cultures around the world. She was also a great friend to the Scott Polar Research Institute, and as well as donating things that she'd collected on her travels to their museum, she also lectured their MPhil students. So Ethel Lindgren's papers that we hold in the archive are actually a very small part of her massive work. Um, she was an anthropologist and a lecturer. She was in social anthropology at the University of Cambridge. And a lot of her photographs that she took are actually at the archaeology and anthropology department. She was primarily interested in ritual and belief, and she wrote her PhD thesis on a female shaman who she'd met in Siberia and struck up a good relationship. Ethel Lindgren did her, the fieldwork for her doctoral degree in Manchuria between 1928 and 1932. This was a tumultuous time to be in the region. The region itself was one of the extensive border regions along the borders between uh, two very uh, important and overpowering empires, the Russian Empire and the Chinese Empire. Um, and especially during the late 1920s and early 1930s, these empires were going through complete convulsions. Um, obviously, uh, there was the Russian Revolution followed by the Russian Civil War, um, the Russian Revolution was in 1917, but the Civil War carried on for many years into the 1920s in eastern parts of the Soviet Union. And then, of course, there was the Chinese Civil War starting in 1927. And on top of this, there was the Japanese Empire, um, which was um, starting to make its presence felt. And so the Japanese invaded Manchuria in 1931 um, precisely when Ethel was doing her fieldwork. So amidst all of these great wars between great powers, um, there were, there are, of course, the indigenous populations um, of, uh, you might call it northern China or southern Siberia or Mongolia, um, who had been living there for centuries and very often they had been living, managing their lives between these various imperial systems. Uh, and one example is the community of people with whom Ethel Lindgren stayed from 1928 to 1932. Um, she calls these people the reindeer tungus. Uh, nowadays, um, I believe they would refer to themselves as Ivenki. So these boots were collected by Lindgren in Siberia, but they look a little bit strange. So we know for sure that they were made by an Evenki craftsperson um, and they're definitely made from an Evenki treated kind of leather, but they're not quite the right style for Evenki boots. And although they have very beautiful embroidery on them, this embroidery doesn't tend to be seen on boots made by Evenki craftspeople unless the boots are for children. And these boots are very definitely an adult pair. So what's going on here? According to the original museum accession register, which first recorded these boots after they were donated by Lindgren, they were actually made by an Evenki person as a gift for a Cossack tradesman. These um, Evenki people lived alongside Cossacks. Now Cossacks... Cossacks were originally the vanguard of the Russian Empire. They were effectively 
um, they created buffer zones, you might say, between the Russian state and the people surrounding it. Um, uh, Cossacks have a very long history. Um, if for quite a lot of it, they were effectively mercenary soldiers who worked for the for the for the Tsarist administration. By the 19th century, Cossacks were not necessarily Russian. They could be from many different ethnic communities, including indigenous Siberian communities. It is not surprising that um, groups of Cossacks had settled in villages along the Russian-Chinese border in Manchuria. Um, and it seems as if Ethel dealt quite a lot with these people um, and they were effectively her, her conduit. They led her, they helped her to get to um, the Evenki people with whom she stayed. Um, these Cossacks, they were earning a living from trading with the Evenki people. And so um, Evenki people would bring them reindeer skins, um, squirrel skins from hunting, and in return the Cossacks would sell them tobacco, tea, sugar, various things. Now, this was quite a well-known thing. Um, if Evenki uh, groups got on well with those Cossack tradesmen, then they would often give them gifts of one kind or another. And so it's thought that these boots in particular were made for a very well-liked tradesman because they were designed in a slightly different way, which was more suitable for his lifestyle, which would include sledding and maybe even walking through heavily forested areas. They also might have added that design as a nice thing for that Cossack tradesman to have, which the Yamenki might not have made for themselves for a day-to-day -day pair of boots. After these boots were given as a gift to the Cossack tradesman, he eventually sold them on to Lindgren himself in a larger collection of objects, which he sold to her for what is known uh, on our accession register as a fairly high price. From there, Lindgren brought them back to the UK and eventually gave them to the museum in Cambridge, which is where they remain today. Ethel Lindgren, thank goodness, returned from Manchuria, um, completed her doctoral dissertation in Cambridge um, and spent many years living and working for the university and in Cambridge. And um, she spent um, much time at the Scott Polar Research Institute and was kind enough um, to leave um, an awful lot of very important material um, to the Scott Polar Research Institute Library. Um, this material consists of books and academic um, journals, some of which are, were published before the Russian Revolution, um, so they're from the late 19th century and the early 20th century. The early Soviet period, the 1920s and the 1930s, um, was a time of great great chaos you might say to some extent um uh people were struggling to cope with the consequences of the civil war um people who uh believed in the communist projects were 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 desperate or very very excited um, about well first of all building the communist society in the former Tsarist empire and second of all um, about simply staying in power. And the early Soviet government knew that it needed the territories of the former Russian Empire very badly. It knew that it needed uh, the natural resources um, and quite simply the, the people power. It needed the people who were living on these territories. Um, and so even though um, uh, according to Marxist-Leninism, the, um, the Soviet project um, intended to liberate non-Russian peoples who had been colonized by the Tsarist Empire. What this liberation actually entailed was um, sort of co-opting them into the communist project by converting them uh, into, into communist atheists. Uh, we're talking about a very, very, very population here. I mean, along with um, reindeer herding peoples like the Evenki, whose um, way of life and spiritual practice um, you might call shamanic, um, in the sense that um, uh, they had um, specialists called shamans who um, conducted healing rituals. Um, there were also Buddhists, there were, is, there were Muslims, um, of course Christians, 
And um, the Soviet government wanted to recreate all of these people into a completely atheist communist society. The Soviet population became a population with um, by the 1950s, which was which universally had had a level, at least a basic level of schooling. Um, and many non-Russian peoples um, uh, were um, now attending university. Um, they were they were they were in collective Soviet collective farms. Some of them were moving to the cities, um, becoming academics and political leaders in their own right. It was a complete transformation. Um, and of course, it's a, it's a very controversial subject. Um, some people feel deeply grateful to the Soviet system. They feel, they feel that they have been brought out of a very ignorant, very poor way of living. Um, but at the same time, it's true that an awful lot of diversity, a lot of language, a lot of tradition, a lot of cultural practice, a lot of different perspectives on the world were lost. Really, this is the huge value that um, the material that Ethel Lindgren left us has, um, because thanks to these documents from before the revolution, from the 1920s and 30s, when the great transformation was just happening, we can see, first of all, how this transformation came about, the complexity of it. Um, but also, we can learn an awful lot about the lives and beliefs and habits of the people who were living in the Soviet Union at the time. And so um, this material is a great resource for contemporary non-Russian, contemporary indigenous Siberian communities. Um, perhaps people like the Evenki, who now live in northern China, um, and have contact with Ivanki living in Russia. Um, this, these, this material is a resource for them to learn a little bit about their forebears um, and about practices that may, may have been lost. In 1947, Ethel Lindgren married her second husband called Michael Utsi, who was a Sami man that she'd met in northern Sweden while she was undertaking fieldwork there. During the course of their honeymoon, they visited the Cairngorm Mountains in Scotland, and while they were there, Michael found that the habitat was very similar to the habitat for rangers that he'd experienced in northern Sweden. The pair returned to Sweden and then came back to the Cairngorms and released a number of reindeer, starting the first herd there that had been recorded in the UK for 800 years. So the archive material we have is actually a um, transcript of a book on reindeer husbandry, she was involved with her second husband, who was a Sami reindeer herder, in bringing reindeer to the Cangorns in Scotland. What we have are hand-drawn maps, some typed scripts, some notes, all the sort of editing side before you get to the publishing. It's, as I say, it's a very small piece of work in a much wider career. They also set up the Reindeer Council of the UK, and today both the Reindeer Council and the Reindeer Herd in the Cangorns in Scotland still exist. So Ethel's paper's nice to have because um, she's one of the female voices in our archive. A lot of our expeditions were male-led and fully male staffed, so it's nice to have a woman's voice in her, her papers, her work. And finally, I would just like to um, end um, with um, a, a copy of a lecture, a printed out lecture, which Ethel Lindgren gave on, as she puts it, the reindeer tungus of Manchuria, um, which, in which she describes a little bit of her time with them. Um, she actually spent quite a lot of time with a female shaman called Olga, and she developed a good friendship with Olga. Although, of course, it's, it's very much written according to the ethnographic conventions of the 1930s. Um, certainly it, it isn't something that somebody would present now. Um, but she um, finishes with a really wonderful evocation of um, the life that she saw, a life that um, was changing dramatically. Uh, and so I'll finish by reading out this paragraph. When I asked the Tungus which they liked best, the village or the forest, they always answered with a glow in their faces, the forest, of course. Sitting in a Tungus encampment on a sunny day in June, 
it is hard to indeed to think of a pleasanter life. The birch bark bands that cover the tents in summer are tastefully arranged in alternating strips of brown and white. And the draft through the opening at the top keeps the interior free from flies and mosquitoes. Children play among the branches of a fallen tree or swing on an improvised seesaw. Young men sit about and talk, whittle at something with their knives, or try a little pole vaulting. I hope that this film has gone some way to showing that there are extraordinary lives in our collections, not only of the people who donated objects to them, but also of the objects themselves. Also available is our video on Jane Franklin.